Nicole Smith here from Blood and Iron Martial Arts with a very special guest all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, the head of his own club, the Phoenix Society, author of this amazing book on Polish Saber, internationally renowned fighter and instructor, Richard Marsden. He's going to be talking to us today about Polish Saber. Hi, yeah, I am Richard Marsden from the Phoenix Society of Historical Swordsmanship, and I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about Polish Saber. Uh, what's fascinating is uh, Polish Sabre is something that does not have an exact manual for. There's no treatise on Polish Sabre from the 17th century, which is the time period we're interested in. And so about two or three years ago, myself and a team of others said, well, what did it look like? And so we spent a couple of years gathering up what information we could and then using various sources, cobbled it together, and we think we have a kind of a good idea of what Polish Sabre is like. We came up with a plausible system, which is what the book covers. So I'll be talking to you today about the weapons, the techniques, how we developed our system, and some of the stories behind it. Our goal is to promote Polish Saber uh, to the English-speaking audience. People in Poland, you, you guys are already taken care of. You already know your stuff. But the rest of us are ignorant when it comes to it. So I'm hoping that we can definitely bring that out and get everybody excited about Polish Saber. Thank you. So first things first, you want to learn Polish Saber. Well, we have to choose a weapon. We have a lot of options, and there's more and more being made all the time by various interested vendors. I only brought a small selection today uh, from Phoenix, Arizona. So starting off with, this is an aluminum by Dave Baker. All right. The aluminum doesn't flex, so you have to be careful with it, but they're pretty durable. Uh, Dave Custom makes these. The guard for it is not historical. The historical guard is more like, oops, that one, which we'll talk about in a minute. But for sparring purposes, this is way, way safer. All right, this keeps your hands safe so you won't get your, your fingers uh, knocked off. Right now, SGT Blades is trying to make a steel one that allow you to have a more historical guard and fight safely, and I hope to show you guys videos on that one later when it comes out. I only have the one right now, uh, so we'll, we'll get some more soon. Uh, but these have held up fairly well. Uh, they've got the nice deep curve, so you can use some of the techniques unique to the system. Uh, lightweight, and it's about the historical weight. Polish sabers uh, traditionally were not that heavy. Uh, so the, the ones for the military would be, but your average side arm that just sits there was roughly about 1.5 pounds. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And these are actually pretty accurate to that weight. They're not very heavy weapons. Uh, on the more cheap end and super durable, we have here a black fencer, which they do a synthetic saber that's really, really durable. Uh, synthetics do have some disadvantages. They aren't as good as aluminum or steel, but they are very cheap. And if you're just starting out, this is a great way to do it. Uh, my book has in the back a selection of various vendors of like who's selling what. That changes all the time, so pick up my book. You can check them there to see you know, what stuff's available and just do a little bit of digging online and you'll find plenty of guys coming out with sabers. Now let's put these aside real quick. I'll show you one that's more historical. All right, so this one was custom made in Poland. Uh, it was originally for sparring, but wasn't able to hold up to kind of the punishment that we, we put things through. But it's more historical when it comes to the guard. So what you see here, it has a knuckle bow, right? Some of the Polish sabers had them, some didn't. Older ones actually used a chain. Here's the thumb ring, which is fairly unique to this particular system. Other swords do have thumb rings, but the Poles are kind of famous for it. And the thumb ring is really, really interesting because by placing it in there, you can get more control off of the blade and be able to stop and turn it. For sparring purposes, you know, you have to be very careful with this because you can get your fingers messed up. So we're trying, again, uh, build swords that are a little overbuilt so you can put in a bigger glove and still use the thumb ring and do so safely. So pretty neat. If you're into cutting, Cold Steel just came out with a, uh, a Polish saber for cutting, uh, and there's a bunch of smiths in Poland that make really, really good work. Uh, and if you go to my Facebook page for Polish Saber, they show up there and they'll post some of the images of their really beautiful sabers and you can buy directly from them. I don't, I encourage you to do that. It's really, really cool. So there you go. One of the things that's really unique about the Polish Saber is the curved blade. So what we'd like to do today is show you some techniques using that specifically. All right, so the very first technique that we're going to do is I'm gonna throw a cut that's gonna transition into a thrust aimed towards the chest. Now, poles, when they were dueling each other, didn't generally use the thrust, but in a mortal combat or in the battlefield, or we just really don't like each other, then it might show up. And so what I'm gonna do very slowly is I'm gonna throw a cut that you have to answer. So I come across like so. As I draw out the parry, because that's what I'm looking for, is I wanna draw that parry, I'm gonna turn my wrist and push this into here. As long as she parries nice and hard, the technique works really, really, really well. Right, comes right in there. 
Even if she pushes, it's okay, because I have that nice curve, and the curve goes around her sword. For the second technique, what we're gonna demonstrate is a thrust towards the head. Just like the one from before, we're gonna launch a cut that I know you have to answer. If you don't, that's okay, I hit you in the head. If you do, then I'm gonna turn my wrist, so I come in, I'm gonna turn my wrist and come over, and I have that nice long curve, right? So even if you're putting high, it's pretty, whoops, see? Yeah, it's pretty amazing how deep the curve can go in order to sort of poke them in the top of the head, which a guy called Gundarat shows something very similar uh, in, in his, his treatise. So we'll do that uh, fast but safely, because it's your head. Right there. Similar technique to the one before, so very, very similar. The third technique is a little interesting because it's gonna use the false edge of the blade, which was sometimes sharpened. I'm gonna throw a cut from over here, again, to draw out that parry. I'm going to pass to get away from your sword, use a reverse Molinet, and a Molinet is when you spin the sword, it's called like a little windmill. I'm gonna reverse it and go backwards, bringing the false edge into your wrist. So we'll go real slow. I'm gonna start from over here. I throw a cut that I know you're probably gonna answer. She does, and I watch my leg here, watch my sword there. Come across, strikes like so. Hits her right into the wrist area, which will disable her. Do that with a little bit of speed. One, two. Very, very quick, you're able to hop over to the other side in order to expose the wrist. So we're gonna demonstrate this from a different angle, so you can kind of see that. Again, I'm gonna throw a cut in order to draw out her parry. She's done so. I'm going to pass, use a reverse Molinet, and bring it right into here, right? Go do a little bit of speed. Easy peasy. Neat way to sort of like disable the hand that uh, I was able to use in tournaments, and it was kind of fun. So now that you've seen a little bit about what Polish Sabre can do, why don't we chat a little bit about the history? Richard? Poland in the 17th century was a very fascinating place. Uh, they had an elected monarchy. The nobility, known as the Szlata, had intense rights, and they could kind of do what they want. Each man kind of was his own king, to the point that they could even rebel against the king legally. Um, these nobles were very wild. Uh, Jean Pasek is my particular favorite, whose memoirs we still have from the 17th century, and a lot of his uh, writings are in the book that I wrote. The Poles themselves valued their saber, and um, I'm gonna tell a quick story that sort of summarizes the Polish culture that's pretty funny. Okay. There was a Frenchman who was in a city, it was a Polish city, and he uh, had encountered a Polish noble who had just sold his grain. And this Polish noble was very, very wealthy. And the Polish noble was fascinated by this Frenchman because he's in his French clothes in the 17th century. It's very different than the Polish clothes. And they begin to communicate, and the Frenchman who's telling the story says, we couldn't understand each other. He spoke Polish, I spoke French. But then I found out that this Pole spoke fluent Latin. The Poles took a, a, a point of pride of, of learning Latin and would then introduce it into their own language. In John Pasek's memoirs, for example, he repeatedly works in little Latin phrases just to kind of show off to everybody like, hey, I speak Latin. So this Frenchman's talking to this Polish guy and the Polish guy and him start drinking. And the Polish guy goes through a bunch of crazy uh, 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 antics. But at one point he's so drunk, he looks at the Frenchman, he says, I, uh, man, I love you. You're great. I'm gonna give you my daughter. And the French guy's like, whoa. He's like, yep. And she comes with a hundred serfs. And the French guy's like, w w serfs? We still have serfs? And like, yeah, in Poland we got serfs. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's gonna, so he's like, I'm going to give you my daughter and land. He's like, well, and they drink more, drink more. And the French guy's getting pretty nervous. He's like, you know what? You, you're not dressed correctly. I'm going to dress you like a Pole. And so this, this, this Polish noble strips out of his robes and clothes, his jupon, his, his delia, the whole bit. And he puts the French guy into it. <laughs> still drunk. And at which point he's like, you're almost done, but there's one more thing I got to give you. And he takes out his saber and he says, this is what gives us our golden freedoms. And this is, it was a symbol of the power and the independence that they had. And he says, this is the most important thing. And he handed it to him. Daughter, land, clothes, meh. but the saber, with great ceremony, it was handed to the Frenchman who took it. Uh, the Polish guy collapsed from drinking too much, at which point the Frenchman uh, said, I had to get out. And that summarizes who these people are. And if you're interested in that, you're like, ah, oh, these seems like a very interesting people in a very interesting time period, then pick up the book, uh, get some more anecdotes out of it. You can find it on Amazon.com. It's the only book on Polish Saber in English, so it's the best and worst book at the same time. <laughs> I'm Richard Marsden. Thank you very much for joining us today, Richard. Thank you.